105 class. I'm Nicole. And I'm Stefania. And today we're going to discuss the electron transport chain. And for most of us, I think we can agree that the electron transport chain is never one of our favorite subjects to go over. Most of us have difficulty remembering the steps and what gets oxidated and what gets redu like reduced. It's a mess. But today we're hoping that this video will solve these problems. Right, Stefania? Right. Okay. Yay. Okay, so uh, what is the electron transport chain exactly and why would we care about it? That's actually a good question because most people have no idea why we even have the electron transport chain in our bodies. But basically, the electron transport chain describes the set of oxidation and reduction reactions that happens in the inner mitochondrial membrane of our mitochondria. Obviously, inner mitochondrial membrane. Anyway, this reaction actually is very important because it produces a lot of ATP. We're talking enough ATP so that all of the metabolic processes in our body can actually be completed. Wow, so that's why the mitochondria is thought of as the powerhouse of the cell, right? Exactly. And okay. ever since high school, powerhouse of the cell is the mitochondria, right? So that is the reason why, because so much ATP is produced there. Okay, so that's why the mitochondria are thought of as the powerhouse of the cell. Mm -hmm. But what about those other two processes, the Krebs cycle and glycolysis? We, they generate the ATP, so why do we even need the electron transport chain? That's a good question, and the reason really comes down to how much energy is produced from each of the processes. So in glycolysis, we only gain a net of two ATPs, not really very much energy. But if we have oxygen available for us, we can actually enter the Krebs cycle and use the electron transfer chain efficiently. Uh, without oxygen, by the way, we can't use those processes. The only process out of those three that we've mentioned that we can use when we don't have oxygen is glycolysis. So when oxygen is available, it's a good deal. We can have a lot more energy and ATP available to us. But more specifically, let's get back to the Krebs cycle. We get two ATPs, one ATP per turn of the Krebs cycle. And then after we go through that process, we can enter the electron transport chain. Um, basically within the Krebs cycle, though, to make this perfectly clear, the reason we go around the Krebs cycle twice is because we have two pyruvate molecules from that one molecule of glucose that we metabolize through glycolysis. Hold on, I thought that you said that we need the energy in order for our cells to function. Mm -hmm. How is 4 ATP going to do that, all of that? And uh, again, what about those other molecules generating dur generated during glycolysis in the Krebs cycle? Um, how are, are they going to just keep accumulating during this respiration process? So what's going to happen to them? Well, let's answer each question one at a time. You're right about 4 ATP still not being very much energy. We obviously still need a lot more than that um, for our metabolism to function properly, as we were saying earlier. So the answer is that we really need to go into each of those processes individually. And each of those byproduct molecules, the ones that you're referring to, other than ATP, are going to be used actually in the electron transport chain and in the Krebs cycle. OK, I remember the 222 rule we mentioned earlier. But let's see where they are released within the glycolytic cycle so I can have a visual. 2 net ATP, 2 NADH, 2 pyruvate. Now one important thing to remember here is that the ATPs we've generated in glycolysis are due to substrate level phosphorylation. That's when the energy needed, needed to make ATP is derived from the breaking of certain covalent bonds and results in ADP getting phosphorylated. As a quick reminder, let's look at a substrate level phosphorylation diagram. A substrate binds to an enzyme where ADP is also found. The enzyme's job is to catalyze the transfer of a phosphate from the substrate to the ADP molecule. Once the ADP gains a phosphate group, we have generated ATP. Exactly, and remember that substrate level phosphorylation does not require oxygen. So it makes sense that we would be making ATP through substrate level phosphorylation in glycolysis. Okay, so I understand that we now have two pyruvate molecules, two ATPs, and two NADHs. But what's going to happen to the pyruvate and NADH molecules now? Actually, it depends on the organism's need for energy. So assuming that we need energy and thus ATP, we take those pyruvates that we uh, previously had generated and we transport them inside the mitochondria. This transport is active transport. That's a key to remembering this, that it's not passive but active. Once inside the mitochondrial matrix, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex will convert the pyruvate molecules into acetyl-CoA. Okay, so can we break down these steps to see what the conversion looks like? Absolutely. So first, let's actually take a look at our diagram. So we start out with our three pyruvate molecules entering the mitochondria through active transport. Then the molecule loses two of its oxygens and one carbon as CO2. 
NAD plus then becomes reduced and we are left with the remaining acetyl group, which is two carbons long. And finally, the acetyl group associates with a cofactor called coenzyme A to produce acetyl-CoA. Overall, the important thing to remember is that acetyl-CoA is produced by the oxidation of pyruvate and that this process occurs twice because we had two pyruvates to start with. Okay, but we still haven't talked about how the NADH molecules from glycolysis get inside the mitochondria. I think that they enter through active transport, but I'm not sure. Well, you're right. The two NADH molecules generated in glycolysis do enter the mitochondria through active transport. It costs one ATP for each NADH to be transported. And since we have two NADHs, then we use up two ATPs for transport. Great! So now we can finally enter the Krebs cycle with our two acetyl-CoA molecules and our NADHs inside the mitochondria. Here, I see that one ATP molecule, three NADH molecules, two CO2 molecules, and one FADH2 molecule are generated from one turn of the Krebs cycle. Right, but remember that we must go around the Krebs cycle twice. So the total numbers of each molecule generated are two ATPs, six NADHs, four CO2s, and two FADH2s. Right, so in reference to where those molecules go that we were asking about earlier, they will actually be used as electron carriers in the electron transport chain. Hmm, but what about the CO2 generated during Krebs cycle and tra the transport? Uh, where are the electron carriers as well? Actually, it's an awesome question, and it's something that most students get confused about. The CO2 that's produced in the glycolytic and the Krebs cycle pathways is actually not used for energy creation. The key to remember is CO2 is a very, very low energy molecule. So now I know that we will be using NADH and FADH2 to transport electrons across the electron transport chain, but how does that relate to making ATP? That's a good question, but we're actually going to answer it shortly. But first, let's get an idea of what the electron transport chain actually looks like and where it's located. Right. Well, I remember from Bio 105 that glycolysis occurs in the cell cytoplasm, while the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain are located into the cell's mitochondria. So do the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain occur in the same area of the mitochondria since they both take place in the same organelle? No. Mitochondria have two membrane bilayers that act like walls, which separate the organelle into different compartments. The outermost bilayer is called the outer membrane, the innermost bilayer is called the inner membrane, and the space separating these two bilayers is called the intermembrane space. The Krebs cycle takes place within the matrix, which is the compartment surrounded by the inner membrane. As for the ETC, it occurs within the inner membrane itself. Okay, I feel like we know enough about the mitochondria at this point. So let's take a closer look at the electron transport chain. Yeah, I want to figure out how those electron transport molecules we were talking about earlier are going to take part into generating the ATP we need. Right, so let's actually zoom in on the mitochondria so we don't get lost. Hold on a minute, what are those balloon-like structures that the proteins are floating in? Those structures are called phospholipids, and the important thing to remember about phospholipids is that they're amphipathic, meaning they have a polar head group and non-polar tails. They're actually found throughout the membrane, and because of their amphipathicity, it's very difficult for large proteins to actually cross them. So what you're saying is that the phospho, since the phospholipid tails are nonpolar, mm -hmm. then the proteins passing through the membrane must also be nonpolar, right? Exactly. And we know this because polar molecules like to be around other polar molecules, like water. And nonpolar molecules like to be around other nonpolar molecules. So those four protein complexes we were talking about earlier are actually embedded in the electron transport chain. They're embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that fifth protein, which is often shown on most electron transport chain pictures, is actually not part of the electron transport chain, but is the ATP synthase.